Hey, good afternoon. Got a lot of stuff to talk about today. I'm not going to lie. This video might be a little longer than some of the others. And for that, I apologize. It's kind of just how the semester goes. But three topics for you today. Manifest Destiny, Texas, and the election of 1860. They all kind of flow together, if you will. So let's talk first about Manifest Destiny here. Um, you can see here there are two very famous portraits the top portrait is supposed to be the ideal vision of the West. You can see frontiersmen and settlers pointing out towards uh, an empty land. You can see on the right-hand side these wagons that are people moving. And then the bottom one, that's supposed to be Lady Liberty going West and spreading civilization. And that's kind of this idealistic vision of what Manifest Destiny was and what people thought was going to happen. <clears throat> Now, what was Manifest Destiny? It's this term that's used in the 1840s, and it becomes kind of the key issue, the hot-button item, if you will. And everybody, this is, like, this is what they really want to talk about. The simplest way to describe Manifest Destiny, it was this idea that God said, go west. Citizens of the United States in the 1840s, they had this feeling that the North American continent was theirs for the taking, that God had put the Americans on North America because he was giving it to them. And the idea, the goal of the Americans was to spread civilization and spread democracy, whether the people wanted it or not, and they had no regard for the people that were already there. Now, the idea of the Manifest Destiny it's going to be spread to the native populations, and it's going to be used to justify war with Mexico. It's going to be used to justify war with Native Americans. It's going to be used to justify persecution of Native Americans and removal of Native Americans from their lands. Uh, if you're familiar with world history at all, some of you may be, some of you may not be, uh, you might have heard the term white man's burden. What The white man's burden is what England was doing in India and in the Pacific, that Manifest Destiny is the American version of the white man's burden, only it was going to be centered on Native Americans. Presidential candidates in the 1840s, it's all they talk about is this idea of expanding the country and Manifest Destiny. So William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, James K. Polk, even uh, James Buchanan are going to talk about expanding the country and the idea of Manifest Destiny. Now, Manifest Destiny speeds up in the late 1840s when gold is discovered in California. Uh, gold is actually discovered in 1848 and then the gold rush starts in 1849 and thousands of people are going to begin moving out west, like tens of thousands of people per year. Now, how are they getting out west? There are three very famous trails. You may have heard of these, you may not have. The first one is the Oregon Trail. Once the northwest corner of the country is settled, uh, there's a negotiation between Great Britain and the United States to see who gets what. Once upon a time, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia were de not declared, but claimed by both the U.S. and Great Britain. Once the negotiation is done, the border is put where it is. Britain keeps British Columbia. The United States gets Washington State and Oregon. And a trail is going to spring up very quickly that's going to move settlers out west. And this becomes known as the Oregon Trail. And it starts in Independence, Missouri, which is not too far from Kansas City. And it's going to go all the way to the Willamette Valley of Oregon, which was very, very fertile, very lush, and a, frankly, a nice place to live. In 1843, which is when the earliest documented use of the Oregon Trail is, a thousand pioneers, 125 wagons, and 5,000 head of cattle just pick up and move from the east to the west and go someplace they've never been before. All total, there are 80,000 plus people who use the Oregon Trail to go into uh, the Willamette Valley 
And there are places in Idaho and Utah where you could still see the remnants of the Oregon Trail. Another very important trail is the California Trail, and that goes all the way from Independence, Missouri into Central California where the gold was discovered. Now, unofficially, the, the California Trail existed since the early 1800s, but it's in the middle of the 1800s when a U.S. Army captain named John Fremont, he's going to officially map out the trail and file it with the U.S. government. And John C. Fremont, by the way, is going to go on to become a presidential candidate. He doesn't win, but he's going to become increasingly important. And our best documentation says that over 250,000 people use the California Trail to move into California. Now, the third of these three trails is probably the least famous. It was the Santa Fe Trail. And it began in St. Louis and went down to Santa Fe, Mexico, today Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it was primarily a trade route. Now, what were they trading? The biggest thing was cattle. Uh, the Santa Fe Trail went all the way from Texas and New Mexico, if you want to look at modern day terms. And it was used to bring cows to St. Louis where they could be slaughtered and then sent to the east for food. Now where are they not going? They're going to not move to the Great American Desert. Now when you think desert you're probably thinking sand, sand dunes, heat, but in the 1840s the Great American Desert was actually the Midwest, the Great Plains, like Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas. They're very very flat. I don't know if you've ever been there or not. It's not much to see, very few trees, and it doesn't rain as much as you think. So Americans originally thought that the Great Plains were inhospitable, you couldn't live there. And because they were seen as being inhospitable, that's where Native Americans were relocated to. If you ever wonder why there's a lot of Native American reservations in Oklahoma or in the Dakotas or in Kansas, it's because those were the places where the American people didn't think they could live. So they gave the worst land to the Native Americans. Uh, conditions in the Old West are very different than what you see on TV. Uh, you've probably seen one Western somewhere, even if it was on accident, maybe a John Wayne movie or a Clint Eastwood movie. And those sh movies always depict tumbleweeds, cowboys and Indians shooting it out. Uh, drunken brawls in saloons. That's just not actually true. That is completely Hollywood. When it comes down to it, less than 5% of all deaths in the Old West were from Native American encounters. Truthfully, Native Americans were more likely to help the American settlers than they were to hurt them. Most of the death that occurred out West was from disease starvation or accidents and how many deaths we don't actually know our best guess is over 20,000 deaths happened from disease and accidents when people were moving out west one of the most famous incidences is the Donner party I've got a picture there of George Donner and his family and George Donner was this very wealthy farmer from southern Illinois, uh, not too far from St. Louis, if I remember correctly. And for whatever reason, he decided to pick his family up and move out west. And his trip is doomed almost from the beginning. Uh, one of the problems is he brings more stuff than he does supplies. Where he should have been packing food and clothes, he's putting his big screen TV into the the wagon and stuff like that. Then he also leaves too late in the year, which, mean, which meant that by the time he got to the west coast it would have been winter. Well, they start traveling along the Oregon Trail, they get lost somewhere outside of Salt Lake City, they meet another family randomly who says, you shouldn't go to Oregon, California is where all the money is. 
So in the middle of the trip, George Donner and his family decide, that's a good idea. Let's go to California instead. And they just start going across the desert. They remember, no maps, no GPS, anything like that. And they get to the Sierra Nevada mountains, which on a modern day map are near Reno, Nevada. And while they're in the mountains, a winter storm hits, a giant blizzard. The weather is so bad that they get stuck. They send a couple of people out to try and get help. Uh, the rest of them that were there eat all the food. And then they start eating each other. So, like, Bob looks at Tom and says, Tom, you look pretty tasty. And before you know it, Tom is dinner. So, yes, the Donner Party, they literally ate other people. It's pretty interesting. Maybe some of you are interested in doing the Donner Party for your research paper. I don't know. All right, another big thing you have to talk about is Texas, because Texas, a lot of people think of Texas when they think of the West. Now, American settlers, they begin moving to Texas as early as the 1820s, and Texas used to be part of Mexico. Uh, Texas actually got its independence from... Me Sorry, let me start over. Mexico got its independence from Spain in the late 18-teens, early 1820s, and Mexico invites people to come settle in the area known as Texas. Now, there are certain conditions that the settlers have to abide by. They have to leave slaves at home. Mexico is slave free, so the American settlers are welcome in, but they have to leave their slaves at home. Well, the people moving to Texas are mostly Southerners. They mostly have slaves. And they get around this by saying, oh, that's not a slave. That's my lifelong indentured servant. The people in Mexico were Catholic. And the Mexican government says, you can come live here, but you have to convert to Catholicism. And most of the people living in the southern United States are either Baptist or Methodist. And they say, sure, sure, we'll convert to Catholicism, and they don't actually do it. The last rule that Mexico imposes, they say, you can come live in Mexico, but Mexico is a different country from the United States. If you buy anything from the United States, you have to pay a tax because you're importing it. And that's when these American settlers say, over my dead body, we're not paying any taxes. Now, by 1835, the tensions between the American settlers and the Mexican government, they are so bad that warfare is going to break out. Now, the Alamo. You've probably heard of this before, but you may not know the true story. First of all, the Alamo was formerly a church. A Spanish church was called a mission. And it was turned from a church into a Mexican government building. It was basically the capital building, if you will, of the province of Texas. Well, on March 6th, 1836, the American settlers take over this Mexican government building. And the Mexico government says, we want our building back, it's ours. And the American settlers say, over our dead body. So... The Mexican government uses force to take back the building that was rightfully theirs, that was their government building. By the time it's all said and done, of the 250 American settlers, or Texicans, if you will, who have holed up inside the Alamo, 200 of the 250 die, including people like, uh, I think, Davy Crockett's there, Daniel Boone, and uh, Bowie, the, the founder of the Bowie Knife, Jim Bowie. Now, because of the Alamo, the Texicans, or the American settlers in Texas, are going to declare independence from Mexico. The fighting lasts about two months, and it doesn't go very well for Mexico. The leader of Mexico, named Santa Ana, is forced to sign a treaty, and Me Mexico is forced to recognize Texan independence. Now, the secret is Texas never had any in intentions of being its own country. The entire time it was declaring its independence, it wanted to become part of the United States. As early as 1836, representatives of the Texas government are going to meet with Andrew Jackson. But the U.S. government wants to avoid war with Mexico, so they say, no, not right now. Go away. 
Also, the part of the government that was anti-slavery, they didn't want Texas because Texas would have been a slave state. Well, Andrew Jackson is going to not be president anymore in 1837. His friend Martin Van Buren is going to become president. The people of Texas say, hey, Marty, will you let us be a state? And Martin Van Buren says, no, not yet. We still don't want war. The end result is Texas is going to be an independent country for 11 years. From 1835 until 1846, the Republic of Texas is its own independent separate country. And side note, this is just interesting. If you ever go to Texas, there are two flagpoles. One flagpole has the U.S. flag. The other flagpole has the Texas flag. Texas is, has the only state flag in the country allowed to be flown at an equal level with the United States because of its recognition as a formerly independent country. So how does the United States get Texas? Well, in 1845, the U.S. Congress votes to annex or take in Texas, and as they thought, Mexico declares war over it. The guy who was president in 1845 and in 1846, James K. Polk, is going to send a negotiator to Texas. They want to buy Texas and buy California. The negotiators aren't allowed in. Uh, Mexico was having its own problems at the time. Eventually, the negotiators are allowed to talk about Texas and California, but there's a dispute over which border Texas should be. Uh, the United States takes the bigger Texas and moves troops into the disputed area, and that's when war begins. So the Mexican-American War, it's going to go from April 25th of 1846, and it's going to go until February 2nd of 1848, and it goes really badly for Mexico. Uh, Mexico City is invaded. The Mexican government is pretty much taken hostage, if you will, and Mexico is forced to surrender. Uh, the treaty that ends the Mexican-American War is called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And that's how the United States gets California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. Uh, there's one more small thing that happens called, called the Gadsden Purchase. That happens in, I think it was 1859, if I'm remembering off the top of my head. And that's where the United States buys the very southern part of New Mexico and Arizona. And the idea was to build a railroad across country. And they needed that land for the railroad. All right, sectional conflict. This is what's going on in the 1850s. Um, and to talk about the 1850s, we have to go all the way back to 1846 because that's when Texas is going to be brought into the Union. Now, after the Mexican-American War, there's this question about what should be done with all the territory gained from Mexico. Should it be free or should it be slave? Now, in reality, that question should have been answered with the Missouri Compromise of 1820, but in reality, nothing is that easy. So the Wilmot Provisio is supposed to solve this question. Now, the Whig Party is going to split over what to do. Some of the Whigs are Southern Whigs and favor slavery. Some of the Whigs are Northern Whigs. They do not want slavery. And the Wilmot Proviso was supposed to ban slavery from all territories ban gotten from Mexico. Now, it would pass the House of Representatives because the Northern Representatives outweighed the Southern Representatives, because remember, the House of Representatives is based on population. But in the Senate, where everything was equal, it would fail because all the Southern Senators said, hell no, we're not going to let this happen. So then they come up with this idea called popular sovereignty, which is where people would get to choose their own adventure, if you will. Uh, it was decided, we'll let the people of Texas decide what they want to do. We'll let the people of New Mexico decide what they want to do. They can take a vote, and they can choose to be slave. They can choose to be free, and everybody would happen, be happy. And it looked like a good solution on paper, but of course it wasn't. It actually makes things worse. Now, what's going on in 1850? Well, there's... Abolitionism, which I briefly talked about in the last video, um, people are becoming radicalized about anti-slavery. Uh, it's becoming more militant, more forceful. There are new political parties being developed. In fact, the Free Soil Party is led by Martin Van Buren, and he was a former 
Jacksonian Democrat. He forms the Free Soil Party, which is very, very, very anti-slavery. And the Free Soil Party is going to be anti-slavery Whigs, anti-slavery Democrats. Manifest Destiny kind of fades into the background, and slavery is going to become the primary talk of the 1850s. Um, there's no talk of education, women's suffrage, the temperance movement. All of those are pretty much forgotten about. And slavery is the number one topic. All right, so we have the election of 1848. Uh, Lewis Cass is the Democratic nominee. He's going to see a popular sovereignty. Let's let the people decide if they want to be slave or free. Martin Van Buren, Free Soil Party. They're going to be anti-slavery. And then the Whigs, who don't join the Free Soil Party, they're going to nominate a guy named Zachary Taylor, who avoided talking about slaves completely. He was a war hero, and he said, vote for me, I'm a war hero. Well, in reality, Zachary Taylor was a slave owner. Um, he basically thought he could just kind of ignore slavery and it didn't exist, and people wouldn't, wouldn't be worried about it. Well, you can see what the, what the uh, votes were. The Whig Party, 163 electoral college votes. The Democratic Party... 127, the Free Soil Party, a big fat zero. Well, to make things even worse, in 1850, California is going to apply for statehood where it wants to be a free state, not a slave state. Now, that would make things unbalanced because at that time there were 15 slave states, 15 free states. And they have to come up with a compromise, a solution to how to solve this problem. And it becomes known as the Compromise of 1850. And Henry Clay, who is the same Henry Clay from the early 1800s, the same Henry Clay who came up with the, the Missouri Compromise, the same Henry Clay who got involved between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, yes, the same guy. Henry Clay is going to propose a solution for this problem. Let's have California come in as a free state. We'll figure out the battle, the boundary between Texas and me, uh, me, Mexico. We'll create a new territory called New Mexico. And then we'll strengthen the Fugitive Slave Act, which I'll tell you about here in just a moment. And then if that's not enough, we'll get rid of slavery in Washington, D.C. Nobody likes this compromise, but it's the best they could get. And everybody's like, we'll pretend it's okay. Now, if you're curious what the Fugitive Slave Act was, it was a law that was passed that expanded slavery to all of the states. Uh, while slavery was technically illegal in places like New York by the time we get to the 1840s and 1850s, the Fugitive Slave Act made it so that somebody could pay a private citizen to go and hunt down a runaway slave. There could have been a runaway slave living in Maine, just like inches across the, the border. Their neighbor is a polar bear or a, a Canadian or something like that. And somebody in Mobile, Alabama could pay you to hunt down that former slave and they could be dragged back to the South. And that's what the Fugitive Slave Act did. If you've ever seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, that's partially how that gentleman became a slave, is through the Fugitive Slave Act. All right, Bleeding Kansas. By the time we get to the 1840s, the territory of Kansas and the territory of Nebraska had been organized, meaning that they had to form a government. The government would be recognized by the U.S. government, and it's the last step before they become states. Now, the Missouri Compromise line said that slavery could not expand north of Missouri. Now, Kansas and Nebraska are both north of Missouri, if you look at a map, and technically they're not supposed to be slave states. But Southerners wanted slavery in both of those territories. So the solution was to bring popular sovereignty into Kansas and Nebraska. Now, the guy who is the proponent, the one who's really talking about it, is an Illinois senator named Stephen Douglas, who's going to become very important. Stephen Douglas says, why don't we let the people choose? They can use a vote 
and decide if they want to be a slave state or a free state. Now, anti-slave people and pro-slavery people start rushing into Kansas so they, they can become residents in time to vote. Now, even before the vote is done, a government of Kansas is set up, run by Southerners who adopt the Missouri Slave Code. So even though slavery has not been voted on in Kansas, it becomes de facto legal. Not only that, but there are laws passed in Kansas that make it illegal to speak out or write against slavery. Hold on. So, in response to that, an anti-slavery faction sets up its own government inside Kansas, and before you know it, Kansas has two different governments, a pro-slavery government and an anti-slavery government. That's one more government that Kansas is supposed to have. So this, this fight breaks out. It's almost like a miniature civil war breaks out in the 1850s. And a man named John Brown is going to become one of the primary antagonists. He leads an attack at Potawatomi Creek where an entire village or entire town is burned down, people are tarred and feathered and left for dead. The arguing over Kansas even gets all the way to the the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. U.S. Senator Charles Sumner gives a speech called The Crime Against Kansas, and I have it linked there if you're curious why that's in blue and underlined. And there's this representative from South Carolina who feels he's personally being attacked by Charles Sumner and he goes up to Charles Sumner while Charles Sumner is on the floor of the Senate and beats him senseless with the cane. Like it, it's an unprecedented event in the history of the American Congress. Now what's the resolution? It takes a little bit of time. Uh, there is a new territorial governor who is appointed who restores order they decide to vote on a constitution. In 1857, the, the choice on the ballot is either a lot of slavery or a little slavery. You can be full-on full slavery or you can be limited slavery. There is no choice that said no slavery. Well, that constitution, known as the Lecompton Constitution, is ratified in 1857. It is a pro-slavery constitution, and the anti-slavery faction has an absolute fit. They petition the President of the United States to get rid of that Constitution. There's a second election that rejects the Lecompton Constitution. And then finally, in a third election that happens in 1859, there's an anti-slavery Constitution adopted. So Kansas does not become a state very easily. Truthfully, the only reason Kansas becomes a state is because of the Civil War. It, Kansas does not become a state until 1861 after the southern states, the pro-slavery states, leave the, the country. That's when the northern states allow Kansas in as a free state, not a slave state. All right, so your last topic is the, alleged, is the election of 1860. Um, the election of 1860 really starts in 1856, which is why it goes along with bleeding Kansas and everything. Uh, the Know Nothing Party, which was this party of anti-Catholic, anti-immigration. The Free Soil Party, which was anti-slavery, and the abolitionists all joined together to form a brand new party known as the Republican Party. And John C. Fremont is going to become the first presidential nominee of the Republican Party. Uh, the current president, Millard Fillmore, runs for re-election as a Whig, and James Buchanan is going to run for president as a Democrat. So there are three parties, three presidential candidates in 1856. Buchanan wins with 174 electoral college votes, John C. Fremont gets 114, and the sitting president, Miller Fillmore, only gets eight. It's one of the worst defeats of a sitting president in American history. Now, James Buchanan, he tries to ignore slavery. He doesn't deal with it. He 
kind of just ignores it completely. But he's eventually forced to deal with it with the Dred Scott case. And the Dred Scott, uh, long story short, Dred Scott was a slave born in 1799. Um, he is sold to a master who lived in Missouri. Uh, the guy was a doctor, and he would go into Illinois and Wisconsin, which were uh, anti-slavery territories. And he would assist his, his owner with medical procedures. Well, when Dred Scott's owner died, he was in Illinois, which was a free state. And Dred Scott claims, since my master died in a free state, I am free. Well, you got Dred Scott saying he's free, and you have the wife of his former master saying, no, you're not, and Dred Scott is sold to somebody else. A court case is opened, and this court case goes all the way through the U.S. Supreme Court. And it's ruled in the end that Dred Scott and his family are still slaves. The ruling uh, says no African American, whether slave or free, could ever be considered citizens, since the Founding Fathers could not have intended such a result. So the Supreme Court's case says Dred Scott is still a slave. Blacks are not citizens, whether they're free or, or still slave. John Brown, the same guy who was in Kansas, after this Dred Scott ruling is handed down by the Supreme Court, goes to Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and starts tries to start a slave revolt. It's put down very quickly, but that's a result of this Dred Scott case. Now, what does Lincoln have to do with this? Um, Abraham Lincoln, just if you didn't know, he was born in Kentucky in 1809. He's not very educated. Uh, he moves to Indiana as a child and then eventually moves into Illinois in 1830. Uh, he volunteers for service in the Black Hawk War, uh, and then he ran for office in Illinois in 1832 as an anti-slavery Whig. Um, in 1837, he's going to... Uh, moved to Springfield, Illinois, where he opens up a law office, and that's a picture of the only house he's ever owned. And then he get, he ends up going to Congress as well. Uh, by the time we get into 1858, Abraham Lincoln is running for president. And he's not president, but he's running for senator of Illinois against Stephen Douglas. And the Lincoln-Douglas debates, there are seven debates that happen all throughout Illinois, one for each congressional district. And Douglas is going to defend popular sovereignty. He's going to keep saying people should be able to choose whether they want to be slave or free. Lincoln is going to say the nation cannot survive half slave or half free. Uh, something has to change. Now, as a side note, Lincoln himself, he says slavery is immoral. But he also did not believe in racial equality, and a lot of people are surprised when they hear that. The other thing a lot of people don't know is, yes, Lincoln was a lawyer, but he was a constitutional lawyer, and he would say slavery is protected by the Constitution. Now, in the end, Lincoln is going to lose the, the election for Senate, but he becomes a household name, and that's why two years later he's going to be nominated for president. So what happens in 1860? There are four major candidates. Abraham Lincoln is a free soil candidate. He's not a Republican. He's a member of the Free Soil Party. He says slavery is immoral, but it's constitutional. Uh, he is against Native Americans. He was pro-relocation. And he's nominated by the Republican Party as well. Stephen Douglas is a Northern Democrat. He is going to be all about popular sovereignty. He doesn't say no to slavery. He says let the people decide. The Democratic Party splits because John Brackenridge and his supporters, they say we need to protect slavery. And then you have John Bell, who's a member of the Constitution Union Party. He's going to try and avoid slavery altogether. His goal is to keep the Union as one as a whole. So you have four different candidates with many, many different views. Well, what happens? Abraham Lincoln wins. You already knew that. 
But what a lot of people don't realize is Abraham Lincoln would have won no matter what. Uh, he had 180 electoral college votes. The next closest was John C. Breckinridge, who had 72. But look at the popular vote. Abraham Lincoln, 1.8 million. Uh, Stephen Douglas, 1.4 million. So how does Stephen Douglas get the second most popular votes, but only 12 electoral college votes? It's because Stephen Douglas came in second in every single state. So this is a good, good example of how the electoral college vote and the popular votes aren't always the same. So after the election of 1860, there's a senator from Kentucky named John Crittenden who tries and keep everything together. Um, he says, we'll extend the Missouri Compromise Line all the way to California. We'll guarantee slavery south of Missouri, everywhere in the country. Uh, Southern congressmen say, we can live with that, but the North, they say, you know what, this is our chance to end slavery, and they reject the Crittenden Compromise. South Carolina is going to secede from the Union on December 20th, 1860. That is actually really important because Lincoln is not president when South Carolina secedes from the Union. James Buchanan still is. Uh, James Buchanan basically says, it's not my problem. I'm not going to be president in two months. Lincoln does not become president until March 4th, 1861. Uh, Fort Sumter, it's located in Charleston Harbor, right outside the city of Charleston today, is attacked by the South Carolina militia, and Lincoln is going to declare South Carolina in open rebellion, and that's when the Civil War is going to begin. Now, what's happening in the South during the election of 1860? Well, there are votes taken in all the southern states on whether they should leave the Union or not. South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas all vote to leave the United States before February 1st, 1861. That's still more than a month before Lincoln becomes president. So Lincoln becoming president is not necessarily the reason the Confederacy was formed. The Confederacy formed before Lincoln was actually in office. Now, how does the Confederate government form? Well, delegates from all of those southern states meet in Montgomery, Alabama, and they vote to form a government. It only takes them eight days. The Confederate Constitution is basically a plagiarized copy of the U.S. Constitution with a couple exceptions. In the Confederate Constitution, the right to own slaves is protected, and the presidential term is six years instead of four. The Confederate president is also given permission to do what's called the line item veto, which meant that the Confederate president could take a law and just erase certain lines from it and leave the rest of it okay. That made the Confederate president really, really powerful because all you have to do is mark out two or three words in a law and the law means something completely different. The guy elected president is Jefferson Davis, who is a senator from Mississippi. And then the vice president is a senator from Georgia named Alexander Stevens. So the long road to the Civil War really starts as early as 1830. And then you got to talk about 1840 with all that expansion out west. 1850 is deciding, well, is all this new land going to be slave or free? And then in 1860, that's kind of when the powder keg keg explodes or the fireworks are set off whatever you want to call it so the most important thing to take from this is the civil war is not out of nowhere it, it it's a long time coming and i guess i need to give you a a secret word for today uh, we're going to make the secret word for today mask m-a-s-k mask m-a-s-k now, final thing I'm going to leave you with, I hope that you watch my video on the research paper. Uh, if you haven't, make sure you look at that. And then don't forget that there are three lessons worth of work this week, even though there are only two videos. So make sure you look at that third folder and you do the discussion and the video out of that as well. Until next week, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.